Welcome back to discussion with vascular experts. Uh, we are today here at the 25th annual scientific sessions for the Society for Vascular Medicine. Um, and I'm here today with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Olin, who is a vascular medicine specialist and a fibromuscular dysplasia specialist at uh, Mount Sinai the School of Medicine. And with Dr. Heather Gornick, who is uh, again a vascular medicine specialist and a fibromuscular dysplasia specialist at the Cleveland Clinic. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And here today, we are here uh, to discuss with them about uh, fibromuscular dysplasia, a disease thought to be uncommon, but perhaps is not as uncommon as, as we presume it to be. Um, Dr. Goldman, can you tell us a little bit more about fibromuscular dysplasia? Sure. Well, I think what we know about FMD is changing by the, by the week, but FMD is an uncommon vascular disease. It affects the arteries, not the veins. It primarily affects women, and it causes narrowing, stenosis, occlusion, dissection, aneurysms, and tortuosity of arteries. Uh, the most commonly affected arteries are the renal arteries and the carotid and vertebral arteries, but it can really involve most arteries from the, the head to the, to the legs. Um, it affects, again, mainly women and women typically in the middle age of life, 40s and 50s, but it can really present from pediatric population to the, to the elderly. Dr. Olin, um, Dr. Kolnick mentioned that this disease perhaps is, is not as, as uncommon as, as we think it is, and there's a lot of new changes in it. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, how common is this disease? Well, we have information on certain populations, but we don't have information on the general population of how common it is. But if you take uh, all, if you take a number of studies that have been done on potential renal donors mm -hmm. and you put them all together, there's about four or 5,000 patients that have been studied by catheter-based angiography or CT angiography. And on the average, about 4% of that population has some evidence of FMD. Interestingly, in the CORAL study in which FMD was an exclusion, that's for those who are not familiar, that's a study on atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis comparing stenting to medical therapy. Five or 5.5 percent of patients had evidence of FMD when looked at by the core lab. And if you separate the 500 men compared to the 500 women, the percentage of FMD patients in women was over 8 mm percent. -hmm. So that suggests that this may be more common than we think, but we don't really know in the general population. I know Heather doesn't think it's quite as common as I do, but what are your thoughts on it? Well, I think it's so hard to know because renal donors, by definition, are generally family members of people with kidney failure, mm -hmm. so they're their sisters. Um, and of course, that population is going to be enriched for hypertension, possibly familial FMD. But I do think it's more common than extremely rare. Uh, I think we just need more more data. I think the fact that we now have a thousand, almost a thousand fifty patients in the U.S. FMD registry enrolled since two thousand nine or so is some evidence that there there are these patients out there. Yeah, that that certainly is a large number of patients. So. And if, if you look at the French data, mm -hmm. they suggests that there's a five-year delay from the first, from the onset of hypertension to diagnosis in multifocal FMD. And there's a nine, I'm sorry, a five-year in focal FMD and a nine-year delay in patients with multifocal FMD. So a lot of people with this are not being diagnosed. Yes. Yes. Wow, that, that is incredible um, how much of a delay that exists. Now, if you, if you do diagnose FMD, then Dr. Gornick, what uh, do you typically do for them in terms of treatment, yeah. Well, I, I usually tell FMD patients there's three things we have to figure out when they come to see me in the office. One is the diagnosis accurate, because patients are referred to me, and I know Jeff with FMD, who end up having vasculitis or another genetic condition, or sometimes even just atherosclerotic disease. So first of all, we confirm the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Then we figure out what vessels are involved. And our protocol at Cleveland Clinic, and I know Jeff has a similar protocol, we now make sure at least one time we screen all the vessels from brain to the femoral bifurcation, the CTA or MRA, to assess what areas are involved and also to look for occult aneurysms and dissections. And then, based on that, we put together a treatment plan. Is uh, intervention needed? 
uh, is medical, plan for medical therapy, plan for surveillance. I will say a lot of the majority of my FMD patients are managed with med medical therapy and surveillance. I don't think having a diagnosis of, of FMD necessarily means you're destined to get a procedure. I don't know, Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, no, I agree. Um, first of all, in the um, American Heart Association scientific statement that, that Heather and I co-chaired, we recommend, and this was a writing committee of many different specialists, we recommend a one-time screening from head to pelvis. Mm -hmm. So I think that should be done because um, of evidence that we presented at the American College of Cardiology, aneurysms occur in about 22% of patients, dissections in about 22% of patients, and if you take an aneurysm or a dissection, one out of every three pa patients will have one of those. So it's important to look for that. And then, um, if they do have an aneurysm, we decide, does it need treatment now, or can we follow it with surveillance studies? If they do have high blood pressure, we decide, is it easily treatable with medication, or was the high blood pressure just diagnosed? Then we might lean towards angioplasty, but most patients we treat with medical therapy. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Um, coming back to you, Dr. Gonick, um, I know both of you recently um, conducted an international fibromuscular dysplasia symposium, the first of its kind in, in, in the world. Um, and uh, I was wondering to get your thoughts about um, what this uh, symposium was about and what, what have you learned from it and, and is anything coming out of this symposium? And uh, actually, Dr. Sharma, you were there with us, so thank you for participating. Yeah. Um, so Jeff and I chaired the first International FMD Research Network meeting in Cleveland. It was just a couple weeks ago, May 15th and 16th. And um, I've done a number of things in my, my career in FMD, but I have to say it was one of the most exciting things yeah. that I was involved with. And we had uh, 90 investigators and clinicians in the field of FMD come to Cleveland, Ohio, including uh, all the U.S., or more, I should say most of the U.S. FMD clinical centers, we had a, a large contingent from France come, including Pierre-Francois Poulain, who uh, leads the French Acadia FMD registry. And we had investigators from Canada and Poland came. And uh, the meeting half the time was spent in state-of-the-art updates, so lectures on various topics and emerging data and FMD. And then the other half the time was spent in closed-door sessions of the investigators focused on strategic planning for how we're going to really figure out this disease. And there were four working groups. There was a group on genetics, chaired by Santi Ganesh, on Im imaging and clinical management, chaired by Jeff Olin, on epidemiology by Esther Kim, and on, on registries, chaired by Jim Freilich. And a lot of uh, interesting plans for the future came forward. Um, there's going to actually be a proceedings paper published later this year in the Journal of Vascular Medicine. And I think, uh, really importantly, help establish a network of investigators who are interested in FMD. And I will say that the conference was supported by uh, philanthropy, by my own Cleveland Clinic, but we also had a grant from the uh, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, so we, we appreciate that. And uh, Jeff's working group actually came up with, I think, one of the most, a few of the most practical things that will come out of that meeting. So maybe you can give you a teaser for the, the paper. Yeah, so. Um one of the things about FMD of the renal arteries is when you intervene on it, how do you know, number one, that you need to do an intervention, and number two, how do you know that you've done an effective angioplasty? So we came up with a protocol to assure that, because it's been our experience that people who have undergone an angioplasty, a certain percentage of them come back and say the angioplasty failed when it wasn't done correctly the first time. So we require pressure gradients in everyone to determine whether someone should be treated. Pressure gradients and IVIS in some patients. After Pressure gradients for sure after treatment. IVIS also to see how effectively you've disrupted the webs. And if everybody does the angioplasty in the same way, then we'll really be able to have um, good results and what the outcomes of that are. Right now, we can't tell outcomes because we don't know, everybody's doing it slightly different and we don't know how effective some of these um, investigators were in relieving the obstruction. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're doing excellent work with, uh, with uh, trying to find out how to 
better treat this disease and perhaps even how quickly to diagnose patients with this disease. Um, with updates from the proceedings from the fibromuscular dysplasia uh, research uh, symposium um, from the FMDSA fibromuscular dysplasia registry, it seems like we have learned a lot of new things. Um, and the AHA statement will certainly help uh, provide more basic guidelines to all vascular physicians or all, all physicians in general. So uh, We have. I mean, in a disease where we have almost no funding, we've done an enormous amount of work. And now people are starting to get funding through various mechanisms so we can delve deeper into this uh, about the genetics of it and the prevalence of it and a number of other issues that were identified at the International Symposium. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for doing so much about this disease.